All right. Sound good? Let's open the Bible. I want to wrap up. Uh, I keep looking at my watch and it's blank. So it died. Let me go to, it's 7.03. So, Don Yates time, I have a long time. Ken time, I don't have a lot of time. So, All right, let's look at Romans. I'm going to be in a, uh, turn to Romans 12. I alluded to this verse a few. It's one of the weeks we were talking about worldview a bit. And I want to end, I told you guys last week, I'm done with worldview, but I want to just wrap up a couple things um, before we start talking about uh, the church. We're always kind of talking about the church, but specifically about church and in in, in as we study in the next few weeks. One thing I want us to do in lines with Uncle Johnny coming I can't help but call him Uncle John, and, and you don't even call, we call him Johnny. You're not supposed to call him Johnny. It's John. That's not official. But I was the, he was, I was his nephew, so we called him Johnny. Um, I want us to be exposed to other people and other perspectives and other ideas and what 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 people are doing. And I'm making some good contacts with people uh, to just inspire us, not in a, in a spiritual manner, and just say, hey, have, have have we thought about this or this is what God's doing here. Um, and, and I tick this way, it, it just it, it fires me up to hear uh, what God's doing around. And so I'm hoping in those, these next coming weeks, months, to, to bring some people in to uh, just share what God's doing where they are, and maybe we can always rob some ideas from them too uh, and, and, and build some new relationships with some people that, um, that we maybe uh, haven't met before as a church. So, uh, so yeah. Um, John's got an interesting perspective because he's been with Northside from the beginning. He's been here quite a few times, and he knows the church. He knows Dad well. Um, he knows the family. Um, he, he knows he gets it and, and knows what we look like and where we are. So I told him, speak freely. You're not going to offend anything. Uh, come in here and do what you do. So I'm excited about that. Back to uh, Romans chapter 12. So we went through uh, our questions our four questions uh, that everyone essentially asks. Does anybody remember those? At least one of them, two of them. Those four questions everybody asks, the big questions in life everyone asks. Why are we here? Not here, but existing. Why are we existing? Where are we going? Uh, where do we come from? What's our origin? So our origin, where we, what happens when we die? Why are we here? And... Uh, wh what's right or wrong? All right. Um, is there a right or wrong? So let's answer some of those questions um, briefly. Not from a Christian perspective. We did that last week. But just how would some of those questions be answered? I did some of this. What, what happens after we die? How would that question be answered from a non-believer? Randomly. Many of them. Just over. Lights out, nothing happens, David. Just go to sleep. All right. That might be one. Going to come back as an animal. Yeah, Ed. Yes. It, depending on your religious faith. Okay, and that's exactly what we're talking about. Depending on what you believe. If you are adhered to a system of belief like Islam, they have a view of what happens next. Now, what about... Are there some people that might loosely adhere to maybe there's a God, maybe there's not, and and something happens, don't know, you know, or or a mix of all kinds of things? Sure, um, we'll just let it let it happen, let it ride, see what happens. Uh, so there, there's that. So and the same can go for morality. So you either you have an authority speaking, like if you're Islamic, you're going to submit to your morality is going to be consistent with what the Quran says or what you've been taught through that culture. Uh, through your family and so forth. Um, and even the question, another question is a worldview question, is what's wrong with the world? Uh, and we answered that last week. We believe sin, the fall of man, and some would say that uh, we went through different systems and how they saw what's wrong with the world, that some of it's just that we haven't arrived at where we should intellectually and we're still striving to get there and as we evolve and so forth, and some people would say, what were some of the answers of what's wrong? Nope, not allowed to use the Christmas perspective right now, Ed. 
Just from a just from a regular Joe's perspective, somebody outside of Christianity. Okay. What would what would Islam say? Yeah, we're we're in rebellion to, to Allah. Yeah. Um so so therefore uh and even Buddhism, which is more of a philosophy, would say that we just uh, need to get our thoughts straight and recognize that pain is not a thing, suffering is not a thing, and so forth, and line our mind correctly. So, all kinds of answers. The point is, I, I wanted to lead you to recognize that we see people that line in groups, and I mentioned this, we see patterns emerge. Uh, that because of what you believe, say, if you commit to evolution, and that we're just mechanics, there is no supernatural, there is no God, it changes the way you see humanity. And we've seen this affected uh, I think I mentioned the Harambe thing. Did, I, did we talk Harambe a few weeks ago? Remember the gorilla that got thrown into the... We talked about that, Randy? The, okay, we did. The gorilla, the, the kid fell in the cage with Harambe. They shot Harambe, and it was all just... That was week one, I think. That it, was a, it, there was, it was scary, and this was 10 years ago, probably. The discussions going on of people that were hesitant to shoot the gorilla because of the value of the gorilla, like they were trying to balance the value of the gorilla with a kid. And we were saying years ago that wouldn't even have been a question. But now, because of the way people see humanity versus animals, in fact, I, there's a quote by a pastor long ago, and it said, where there, are, where there is the worship of animals, there will be human sacrifice. And I was like, ooh, man, that, that rings true. And this was written long ago. Um, Basically saying, because we're elevating the way we see animals, we're willing to lose humans quicker, you know? But yeah, why are we doing that? Because when we're just matter in motion, when we're just nature, what separates us from the gorillas? Except intellect. And some would even say that dolphins are smarter than us. And hey, you've seen people jokingly, and some are pretty serious that say, I like my dogs better than people. I mean, it's one thing to joke about it, but that's some really... Buy into it. I guarantee you, I call this with teenagers already, you're going to see human and animal marriage proposed coming up. It's down the pipeline. Because of how mess you it's gonna it's gonna happen. It's gonna be on the table. There's gonna be groups pushing for that more and more. Yeah, it is. It is. There's the freakish groups that are already doing that, but it's gonna become more mainstream just because theirs is no hold bar. I mean, imagine that we'd be having this conversation about call yourself they. We never, we had laughed at that a few years ago. Uh, that's coming down the pipeline too, because what, what goes, Randy? Oh, I thought you raised your hand, Ed. It was you. Yes, it is. Sure. Yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. What does Romans say? We begin to worship the creation over the creator. And there's people that worship trees and talk to trees and so forth and take it to that extreme. And then there's those that are more cultural environments, that environmentalists, but that with no God, what matters, Ed? That, that what you're saying, I'm agreeing with what you're saying, but the, what nature, the here, the now, we've got to preserve this. This is all we got. Uh, That there's a video I used to show my one of my worldview class or apologetics class of these people out in the middle of the force crying and stuff is patterns emerge. Patterns emerge. And it's so interesting to me that Romans 12, that verse that many of you might have memorized when you were a kid, um, you see because of what you believe at your, found, believe at your foundation, it affects, and, and you see not just one individual, but, but groups of people following this. It affects the way you see things. Uh, and Romans spots this in Romans 12, verse 2. Let's look at that real quick. It's just so crazy because you think, like, this is heady philosophical new stuff. No, no, no. The, that this is in our ancient text right here saying that, that, that Paul saw this, that the Holy Spirit led him to write this, that this is there. Romans 12. And, oh man, I, I, I love one of my favorite passages to unpack is 12.1, and I'm not going to do that right now, but... Let's start in 12.1. Hopefully we have time for this. 12.1 talks about, he just got done talking about the gospel and the good news of Jesus. 
and what he's done in, in, in his resurrection. And he's saying, because of that, verse 12, tw- or excuse me, chapter 12, verse 1 of Romans, therefore, so the therefore is pointing to the, what was before. Therefore, because of what the good news of the gospel, basically, is what he just talked about. Brothers and sisters, in the view of the mercies of God, I urge you, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And I love this. Some of your, ver- your Bibles say this is your reasonable service. He's basically just saying this is your natural reaction. It's just what you do, like Geico says, right? It's just what you do. When you realize what God's done for you, your response, like a spring, like a reaction, your natural reaction is to live for Him. A living thank you to Him. You'll hear me preach this eventually, so sorry, it'll come out. But you're basically a walking, living thank you note to, to God. That's your response. Now, I want to spend our, our time in, in the next one here. Then he says, do not be conformed to, some of your versions say, the pattern of this world. And I just find it so interesting that those words in, in translation reflected the patterns of this world. My, my version says, to this age. Do not be conformed to this age, to this, basically to the cultural thinking, but be transformed by the renewing of your What's it say? Mind. So that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So he's talking about some, some real battles going on within your mind here. And I think of um, how Paul goes back to his words of what I want to do, I don't do. And there's this struggle, and ultimately this is an issue of authority. So it's neat to see the stuff we've been studying these past weeks is basically who's your authority, and based on who or what your authority is for your life, it calls the shots on how you see humanity, how you see where we came from, how you see where we're going, how you treat people, how you see animals, how you see the world, how you see everything, the decisions you make in life, they are a result, the actions you live out are based on who your authority is or what your authority is. That makes sense? The questions I ask you when I go through, where did we come from? You guys are going to say creation. We already did this. Created by God. Um, What's wrong with the world? Sin. What's right and wrong? Whatever God says is right and wrong, right? It's all God, God, God. He's your authority. He's your king. He tells you how to live. Okay. Take that away. We're on our own. It's Where did we come from? Well, we evolved. Uh, matter from nothing, random chance. Um, what's wrong with the world? People. And we need to figure out how to live in harmony together. And how do we do this? Good question. Look around at our society. They're trying to figure it out. Um, <laughs> um, where are we going? Who knows? Who cares? We, not necessarily anywhere. Or we go to sleep, like, like David said, and so forth. Now, how does this affect the way we see animals this, and, and plants and and creation, well, they wouldn't say creation, changes everything. Where we see people are made in God's image and have ultimate value because they're God's and He made them, that's how we see humanity. It affects the way we see a baby. It affects the way we see someone with, with a, 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 a mental deficiency or a physical ailment or whatever. We see them all equal because this is what the Scripture teaches us. This is what the Holy Spirit does in us to see people. Now, you take that out of there, how do we see people? What's whatever they put into the world? Right? What they can give. Or animals, man, they're just as smart as humans. They're like right here, right? Or maybe a little higher because they're nicer. My dog doesn't talk back to me. Whatever. You're just making this stuff up. So, bottom line is who's your authority? And, and this is recognized right here in Scripture. Now, um, the Scripture warns us it's interesting too to see Paul engaging the culture and the worldview of the day. And I want you to catch this in the Scripture. Oftentimes, here it's talking specifically about the mind. Now, and it's, it's question whether Paul and, and Jesus did this too when he would say things like body, soul, mind, where he was, if, if there's been questions, scholars have said, did Jesus believe there was a separation? All the point is that Jesus is making, and I believe Paul's making here, is all of Ed, all of Randy. All of a man that you're all in. It doesn't matter. In the day, in the time, there was something going on called dualism. You've ever Plato and Socrates and all those names out there? They were all battling with whether 
is a is Mike just a mind or is he a body? Is there a soul? What was the one where it's body, mind, and soul, Pastor? Do you remember? I'm guessing it's try something or but there was the discussion whether we're body and we're mind or were we body soul? Is mind the same as the soul? There was all this question. So when Jesus made statements like "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind," he was engaging the thinking of that day. He wasn't necessarily saying that this is a divided thing. He was saying all of Neil, whatever you believe. So that's where they were taking possibly a distorted truth and just saying it's all mine. All right, and clarifying that. And the same with Paul here. Paul's reminding us that the mind is important. And now I, I believe again this is question of whether he's obviously saying your mind's important, but they weren't getting into the nitty gritty of which one or so forth. He's just saying all of you, especially your mind. This was a, a belief in this age that they believed, and I don't I don't want to chase into this. They believed the mind was equal to and the thoughts were equal to um, supernatural. Okay? Um, it was, that was um, the word I'm looking for. Um, I'm blank right now on that. But anyway, not important. But anyway, he's just saying, ultimately, your mind is all God's. Renew your mind. Uh, your authority is God's, and he shapes your mind. Look at 2 Corinthians 10.5. 2 5. Corinthians 10, verse 5. I love this verse, and this fits right into everything we've been talking about. And I could read right before that. It's a great verse too. Or this whole passage is really good. But let me start in four. Since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, I think I mentioned a few Sundays ago, we're not just at wage with humans. Remember, humans are, are blinded like we once were, but we are wrestling. It says right here, but all powerful through God for the uh, demolition of strongholds, we demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take, I love this verse, every thought captive to obey Christ. We take every thought captive to obey Christ. So everything we take in, we've got to see through, you've heard this, and this is something I've used a lot in talking worldview, because you're saying view, you see things through the lens. Everybody look up here real quick. Through the lens of, Scripture, through the lens of the Gospel, through the lens of how would Jesus see this. Think that way when we see things. Take every thought captive. And, and, and that's where we have to, and this is what's constantly going on in the Scripture, is they're saying, is this a worldly thing? Is this a, is this a um, uh, um, humanistic thought? Is this a cultural thought? Is this a, hey, is this just the way I grew up thought? Or is this a godly thing? What does the Bible say about this? That's taking every thought captive. And there's things we'll sit in the church and assume are biblical, and they're not. And so we have to take it in, take every thought captive. So, back to uh, Romans 12. What he's reminding us there is that we are holy transformed all of us and uh, that God is the God and our king of everything and it shapes what we do it shapes how we see people it it is um, not that we pick and choose uh, where God is again this this passage here and reflecting to when when Jesus said uh, very much looks like him saying love the Lord God with all your heart soul and mind this is saying all of us. This is our, our whole bodies. And Paul was just there talking about our physical bodies. Then he jumps to our mind. That That is our foundation. Think of the glacier we talked about. We looked at that picture. This is the foundation. This is the springboard of how we see everything. And then it jumps on. I love how this passage goes right into, in Romans chapter 12, right after verse 2, it jumps into verse 3. And what does it start talking about in here? In these next couple of uh, verses or by grace you've been given to me or by the grace given to me i tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should instead think sensibly as god has distributed a measure of faith to each one so then it starts talking into 
where Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Then it said, love your neighbor as yourself. Here we start talking about people in the body and how we work together as members in Christ's body. And he starts talking about how the church is made up to do that. The action, the results of that. Questions? Comments? Thoughts? You guys are quiet at night and that scares me a little bit. This is not normal. <laughs> Ed, you got something. Yeah. Oh, okay. Look at Luke 10 27 with me. That's the verse I've been in the, quoting. The, the Plato, the Platonic thinking that had influenced Rome in the day, I, can, I just can't remember the term for it, was where they would think, and this will clarify what he was saying by the mind. And the reason he was emphasizing the mind, if they thought of a chair, they believed that the mind could think it perfectly. But when it was brought into the material world, it could not be made perfect like the mind. And the mind was equivalent with the supernatural realm. And that's where it really went. So when John, in John 1, this is really cool stuff, um, when in John 1 says the Logos, that's what he was referring to. That thing in the mind they thought, this, this is what you guys see as the supernatural, the, the big perfection that not material. He was saying, Jesus is that thing you've been looking for all along that you think's out there. He's right here. So go ahead. And they have the Plato's Cave story that, that was about the guys in the darkness and they saw the light. Yeah, yeah, that was... Yeah, and the whole point, I'm not trying to give you guys a mumbo-jumbo mind stuff to think about. It's just the whole point is what I'm, what I'm trying to see you is that these guys were speaking as we're learning about worldview. Let me bring this to a head, what, what I'm trying to say. As we're learning about why people think the way they do, they did too. So it did matter to be familiar with it. One, to guard you... to from letting it seep into the church, into Christian worldview, be able to distinctly recognize this is not godly and this is godly. So they, Paul and them would familiarize himself with the culture to engage it and also to be able to separate and say, no, this is not, this is not gospel thinking. This is not clear biblical thinking. To be able to discern what was worldly and what was godly. So that's what I'm trying to get at. That, that they, they knew the thinking of the day and age. And Paul would have conversations with philosophers and so forth. So it's important for us to recognize that, uh, to be able to, to recognize it. One, to guard this place, this community, this, this people, the doctrine, as uh, Pastor Ken said earlier. That's the most important thing. And that's the responsibility, too, of the congregation with a pastor. This, this guy starts getting to be quacky. Now you guys got to call him out, okay? Uh, whoever is this pastor here, and in all churches, that's the responsibility of the congregation, but it's to recognize the culture and, and to protect the church and at the same time be able to engage them with like, look, you're on to something, but you don't know the, the whole truth. And this is what basically John did with Logos. Paul's doing it here. Jesus did it here. And I'll wrap up with this in Luke 10, 27. Yeah, Jesus could do like, hey, I made that thing you're talking about. Let me tell you how it's really done. <laughs> Luke 10, 27. Um, when they were trying to throw a um, question at Jesus, and he answered, this was a, a, a lawyer trying to trick him as he tended to, and he'd always throw it, twist it right back on him. He said uh, about the law. So he, he of course, the, the higher religious, the Pharisees are always trying to throw the law at, at Jesus. We talked about this when we were going through the person of Jesus when I first got here. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes on to talk about who's my neighbor and so forth. And goes into that parable of the Good Samaritan that we talked about. So there, once again, we Jesus is showing that when you believe this, this is the effect it has on your behavior, on what you do. Who's your authority? Who's your authority? That's a great question. Um, give you a, a good apologetic question to ask, and really a biblical question to ask in our church. Who's our authority? With everything we do. But you can definitely use that question when you're engaging a non-believer. I've done it with my kids. <laughs> and, and with people I've talked to, skeptics, whatever, when they get into especially ethical questions, ask them by what authority. 
And they're going to run to, well, I don't believe that God stuff you talk about. Well, then who's your authority? What's your authority? Is, any, is there any truth? Like, what separates you from what the other guy thinks? But ultimately, as a church, we need to ask that in everything we do as well. What's our authority by what authority? And we want to be looking by, does the Bible to speak to it? And we can talk in another day on how that's recognized and seen in the Scripture. Does it speak directly to it? Does it speak in principle to it? Does it imply? Is it in, you know, how, how is it written? Is it clear, black and white? Or is there uh, something we can le- lean, lean in and learn from a story that's in the Scripture? And that's another sermon, another time. Who's your authority? Uh, so that's, we'll wrap up this whole worldview thing with looking at that and thinking about that. Uh, ultimately, your authority affects your actions. And it's either God, most of you have committed your life to God, He's your authority, and you want to live that way. And for our world, it's ultimately the God of this world or themselves or so forth. Um, and you can lead them into that and hopefully lead them to the good God, the good King that we follow, who rules all whether they acknowledge it or not. Um, and we want to lead them to that truth. So, any questions? I was all over the place tonight. Thank you for bearing with me, but hopefully we just kind of pulled a little bit of this together. Got a couple of them out. We wake them up a little bit. <laughs> all right. Oh, we're getting people to sleep. I just, y'all can just play my sermons on YouTube at night to go to sleep with. <laughs> there you go. I just have that soothing, gentle voice. I could be like that. I could really scare right now. But, all right, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this time. Uh, thank you for our time together. Thank you for uh, you being the Lord of our minds, heart, soul, everything. God, I pray we take everything uh, under your authority. Um, God, what we do with our bodies, uh, what we do with our minds that we would take, as, as Corinthians says, every thought captive. Um, and our soul, God, you, you're the king of our soul, and our soul will remain, and all of us will remain. You're going to make a new body. You're going to um, make us new completely. So God, I pray we're completely sold out to you in everything we do, everything we say. Um, may it all be yours. May we surrender it all. Uh, God, guide us in the future as um, and we don't want to do what we want to do. We want you to be our authority in these, these new days. Every day is a new day ahead. So we pray for that in our journey as a church, as you continue to grow. May we lay a solid foundation for those that are to come behind us uh, that points to you, Jesus, that keeps you central. Um, may it be no question at Northside of who our authority is, that you're the head of this church. Um, you're the captain of our salvation, and we rest in that. We thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen.